Isomers are the same in some ways and different in others. They have the same molecular formula but differ in some aspects of their structure. We're familiar with constitutional isomers which have completely different connectivity but the same molecular formula. But our focus in this unit is really on stereoisomers. Stereoisomers have the same connectivity if we think about which atom is connected to which other atom and how many bonds and all that good stuff. They have the same sort of molecular graph of how the atoms are connected to each other and the, the bond orders and things like this, but they differ in the positions of atoms in three-dimensional space. So stereoisomers have the same molecular formula, the same connectivity, but they are non-superimposable. They are not identical. There are two classes of stereoisomers, enantiomers and diastereomers. Enantiomers are stereoisomers that are mirror images. In other words, they are non-superimposable mirror images, enantiomers. And the classic example of enantiomers are your two hands. Non-superimposable, they can't be perfectly overlaid on each other, but they have the same connectivity. The thumb is next to the index finger, then the middle finger, then the ring finger, then the pinky. So your hands are enantiomeric. Diastereomers are stereoisomers that are not mirror images, essentially everything else. And the classic example I think of diastereomers in organic chemistry involves alkenes, cis and trans alkenes. For example, cis-2-butene, which is this compound here, is a diastereomer of trans-2-butene. And critical to this, critical to these two compounds being stereoisomeric, is that there is no rotation around the carbon-carbon double bond. If there were free rotation around that carbon-carbon double bond, these would be conformational isomers and would really be beyond the scope of this unit and, quite frankly, not worth caring about that much. Because there is no rotation about that central double bond, these are two distinct, isolable compounds with very different physical properties, and this is true in general of diastereomers. So in the remainder of this video, we're going to develop a thinking process and sort of a flowchart for determining the isomeric relationship between two compounds, starting all the way at the constitutional level and going all the way down, quote unquote, to the level of stereoisomerism. And then we're going to practice with a couple of examples. This slide shows a series of questions that we need to ask ourselves to determine the isomeric relationship between two compounds with given structure. I guess the very first question we need to ask ourselves is, do they have the same molecular formula? This is worth checking if you're not given the molecular formula first and foremost. Make sure that they have the exact same number of carbons, hydrogens, and other atoms as well. Assuming that's the case, and the question's not just trying to be tricky, the next question to ask is, do they have the same connectivity? If yes, then we move on to the next question. If they don't have the same connectivity, well then we know that they are constitutional isomers. And this is worth noting here on the slide. It's not our focus in this unit, but it's something that you'll see qu quite frequently. And it's, it's worth folding constitutional isomers into your thinking about stereoisomers a, as well. We want to think about isomerism kind of as a general framework now. And at this point in your chemical education, you've seen essentially all the types of isomerism constitutional, configurational or stereoisomerism, and conformational isomerism, which is something that comes up, for instance, with cyclohexane chair forms. All right, so say they have the same connectivity. Are they superimposable is the next question. If the two structures are superimposable, well, that's just two different viewpoints of the same compound. The two compounds are identical. Homomeric is a bit of an old school term that you may hear used to refer to two structures that are in fact identical. If they're not superimposable, well then we're in a stereoisomerism situation, but there are two types of stereoisomers, mirror images and not mirror images. If the two compounds in question are mirror images, we've already verified they are not superimposable. Non-superimposable mirror images are what we call enantiomers, and we've already touched on the fact that a chiral compound has one and only one enantiomer. So enantiomers are two chiral compounds that are related as mirror images. If the two compounds in question are not mirror images, then we're at the diastereomer level sort of by default. We verified they have the same connectivity, but they're not superimposable and they are also not mirror images and this makes them diastereomers. So with these three and arguably four questions, if you incorporate molecular formula, we can determine the isomeric relationship between any two compounds with given structure.
To practice, let's determine the isomeric relationship between these two compounds. The first thing I'm going to do is just name each compound by assigning it a number, essentially. Compound 1 on the left and compound 2 on the right. These do have the same molecular formula. We've got, looks like, eight carbons. We've got one oxygen, and we have the same number of hydrogens, which is going to be 16 hydrogens if my math skills serve me correctly. And if you want, it's worth pausing the video and drawing in those implied hydrogens to verify this. But in any event, they definitely have the same molecular formula. Are they identical is the first question we need to ask ourselves. Do they have the same connectivity? Let's start with the connectivity question. And a great way to think about doing this is just to flatten the structures and compare them to each other. If we ignore the wedges and dashes, we get a structure like this. We can give this structure a name, and this harkens back to a point we made in a previous video, that you can use IUPAC nomenclature when you're thinking about comparing two structures to see whether they're the same or different. The name of this compound is 2,3-dimethyl cyclohexanol, but in fact, that's also the name of this compound, right? One, two, Three. So this is 2,3-dimethyl cyclohexanol as well. So they have the same connectivity. The next question is, are they identical? Are we actually just looking at two different perspectives on the same structure? What jumps out to me to answer this question is that I've got the methyl groups on the left-hand side of molecule 2, but on the right-hand side of molecule 1. So if I'm going to try to superimpose these structures perfectly, I'm going to need to, for example, turn over molecule 2 like this. In fact, this would line up the methyl groups, and this is worth verifying in three dimensions. This dashed methyl group is going to swing to a wedged position when I rotate it around like this, and this wedged methyl group is going to swing to a dashed position when I rotate about an axis like this by 180 degrees. So those are actually going to line up. The problem is with the hydroxyl group. This hydroxyl group, which is already lined up between, carbons, uh, between compounds 1 and 2, is going to swing to a backward pointing position after this rotation, and that's not going to line up with compound 1. So these are not the same. They're not identical structures. This means they're stereoisomers. They must either be enantiomers or diastereomers. Now, how do we proceed in determining whether they're enantiomers or diastereomers? Well, the, our process tells us the next question is, are they mirror images of each other or not? So how do we determine whether they're mirror images or not? Well, if we think of this in sort of brute force terms, what we can do is generate the mirror image of one of the structures and compare that mirror image to the other structure. If the two are identical, then the two compound, the two original compounds are mirror images of each other. An alternative strategy for this involves finding a reflection plane that reflects, for example, molecule 1 into molecule 2 perfectly or, or vice versa. But for this problem, I think it's easiest and, and least error prone to actually generate the mirror image. So let's do that by reflecting this compound through a mirror plane. Now let's reflect through the plane of the screen. What, what this will do is it will send this OH to the back, it will send this methyl group back behind the screen, and it will send this methyl group out in front of the screen. So this is the mirror image of compound 1, and let's call it 1 prime. Now, compound 1 is chiral, and this is worth verifying on your own. So in fact, 1 prime is the enantiomer of compound 1. And the question now is, is it identical? Is 1 prime identical to compound 2? If so, then 1 and 2 are enantiomers. If not, 1 and 2 are diastereomers. So to get a sense of this, what we're trying to do is line up compound 1 and 2 perfectly so that they superimpose. If they do, we know they are identical. So in order to do this, well, I notice this hydroxyl group is not in the right position in 1 prime. So let's rotate 1 prime about a, an ax, a vertical axis, 180 degrees, to swing that hydroxyl group out of the plane of the screen. At the same time, this is going to swing this methyl group to the other side of the molecule in an upward pointing position. There it is. And it's going to swing this methyl group from an upward pointing position to a downward pointing position on the other side of the molecule, like so. So this is the structure after this 180 degree rotation through an axis like this. Now the question is, is this identical to structure 2? Another viewpoint on 1 prime, is this identical to structure 2? Hydroxyl group looks good, but the two methyl-bearing stereocenters do not look good. 
right? This upward one has a wedged methyl, but in two, it's got a dashed methyl. In one prime, we got a dashed methyl at the bottom, but in two, we've got a wedged methyl at the bottom. These are not the same. So we've determined that two is not the same as the mirror image of one, meaning one and two cannot possibly be enantiomers. They are not mirror images. Therefore, we've ruled out enantiomerism for the relationship between one and two. This leaves diastereomers as the kind of by default relationship here. And one thing I think that is helpful to notice is that these compounds are the same in configuration at some stereocenters and different in others. Enantiomers have different configurations at all of their tetrahedral stereocenters, but that's not the case in this compound. And this is worth verifying on your own with RS labels. This is what makes them diastereomeric. They differ in configuration at some, but not all, of their stereocenters.